I'm back, Dr. Vinay Prasad from the University of California, San Francisco. I've got a new video for you, and I'm going to do something special. I'm going to take a few of these and stitch them together into a plenary session podcast episode in the future. This video is on MRI screening for prostate cancer. It's a new paper out now in the New England Journal of Medicine. What do you need to know? Well, I tried my best to explain this paper in a series of tweets, and like everything on Twitter, it went to shit. People couldn't understand what I was getting at. So let me try very clearly to explain what I think is the major pitfall of this paper. MRI targeted or standard biopsy in prostate cancer screening. It's very interesting. Now, we all know prostate cancer screening is a hotly debated topic. I remember over the years, I've been a part of many debates. Why is it debated? Well, we have multiple randomized control trials that have conflicting results. We have the US PLCO study, the prostate, lung, colon, colorectal, and ovarian cancer trial. Well done, really meticulously run randomized control trial of prostate cancer screening where participants were screened annually or they were in the standard treatment arm. Uh, at the end of follow-up in the PLCO study, there was no statistically significant reduction in prostate cancer death, nor was there any statistically significant reduction in all-cause mortality if you were in the screening arm versus the control arm. Now, the the pitfall of PLCO is that in the control arm, you actually got one prostate cancer antigen screen, one PSA screen over the duration of the study. That's called contamination. Why was there contamination? Well, because people had already fallen in love with doing this and were making money hand over fist from doing this. So of course, naturally, it would be very difficult for them not to do it, even in the control arm of a large national randomized control trial. The, con the intervention arm, of course, had many more prostate cancer tests, and they found more prostate cancer, and yet, despite those facts, they couldn't translate it into a reduction in prostate cancer-specific mortality. And I think some people believe that it would have found a benefit if that PSA testing in the control arm was zero. I think that's, 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 that's probably a dubious proposition. Um, they did more screening in the intervention arm, and they found way more cancer. So if finding that extra cancer... Um, was beneficial, there would be a commensurate reduction in prostate cancer specific death, which there wasn't. So this is a trial I think of annual screening versus one accidental uh, opportunistic screen in the control arm. We've got a UK randomized control trial, which is one versus zero, and that failed to find a benefit. And we have the European study, the RSPC, which is a pooled sort of meta-analysis of multiple randomized control trials around Europe that did find a statistically significant 20% relative risk reduction in prostate cancer death although admittedly not even a budge in a movement uh, in all-cause mortality. Um, the problem with uh, the European randomized control trial, of course, is that this benefit was driven by two out of seven nations that participated. And I think there are a number of other reasons that I won't get into because this video is about this MRI paper, um, why I think those results are generally sort of thought of critically. But even if you were to accept those results, I think there is still a large number of diagnoses of prostate cancer you would have to make and treat to avert one death from prostate cancer. And if you're interested in that, you should check out a paper by Sunny Kim, Go Nishikawa, and myself uh, called A Modest Proposal for Cancer Screening, which appeared in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine. So this is the background to this paper. We have prostate cancer screening. We have disputing studies. There's a lot of over-treatment, over-diagnosis, and there's a lot of interest in getting prostate cancer screening more efficient. And in fact, the authors of this paper point out that only Lithuania has organized prostate cancer screening because most nations are worried about the risks of overtreatment and overdiagnosis. So they did this study. And this is the study that falls uh, as yet another study in a long series of studies exploring the role of magnetic resonance imaging um, in identifying prostate lesions and biopsying those lesions in the hopes that of all the, the, the PSA positive testing you find, um, you're only biopsying people who have visual, visual, visual lesions, who are at high risk of something bad happening. Hopefully, we'll just remove those prostates, and we'll be able to improve upon the characteristics of prostate cancer screening. So MRI is a way to kind of salvage PSA testing, and that's what they did in this paper. Now, before I get into what I think the fatal flaw here is, um, let me just say what the authors believe they've shown. The authors believe that by doing MRI-guided screening, instead of conventional, sc conventional screening, you will find the exact same number of uh, clinically significant lesions, which they defined as Gleason 7 or higher. You will find fewer clinically insignificant lesions, which is Gleason 6, and you will find um, less benign biopsies, benign normal prostatic tissue. 
So in other words, if you did, you'll do fewer biopsies, you'll still get all the Gleason 7 and above as you otherwise would get, but with less of the stuff you don't want, the sixes and the benign lesions. That's how the authors interpret their study. So I think their interpretation is this is a win. This is a way to take PSA screening where you worried about overtreatment and overdiagnosis and improve upon it because what you've actually done is identify all the same high-risk individuals, what they call clinically significant biopsies, and you've reduced the clinically insignificant, the Gleason 6s and the benign biopsies. That's how they view it. I view it a little bit differently. And I actually think it's really more complicated than what they think. And their study is actually fundamentally inadequate to really answer the question we want. So let me explain how I view it. So as I was saying, there's one of four things that cancer screening tests can find. And this is important. This is really the goal. A cancer screening test uh, can result in a false positive. So, you know, you biopsy normal tissue or you uh, think something's suspicious, it turns out not to be in subsequent testing. So that's something that you don't want to find when you do a uh, cancer screening directed biopsy. The second thing is you could biopsy disease that looks like cancer on histopathology, but if you hadn't have biopsied it, if you hadn't have found it, it wouldn't have done anything to harm someone in the natural life. Um, it wouldn't have caused morbidity nor mortality. And this is the classic overdiagnosed uh, cancer, a cancer that wouldn't have done anything. In the classic analogy uh, popularized by Welsh, this is the turtle in your barnyard, if you know that analogy. The third class of things you could find is cancer that um, has already metastasized outside the target organ. And in fact, you find it, you think it's localized, you may perform a prostate removal, a prostatectomy, um, but the cancer has already fled and inevitably it will grow elsewhere and cause problems. Um, this type of cancer, the cancer that has already left the primary site, um, it's really debatable whether or not you've made someone better off by identifying this. Um, sure, you can remove the local mass before it becomes symptomatic, um, uh, but you are very unlikely to avert the long-term outcomes and improve um, their survival. Um, they, and, and there's a lot of data that suggests that earlier treatment of metastatic disease doesn't improve survival in a number of malignancies. It depends on the malignancy and depends on the specific treatment. It's kind of a broader, a broader category, but that's really not what you're looking for. The fourth thing, the thing that you're really looking for is prostate cancer that was going to spread. It was going to metastasize. It was going to kill somebody, but by finding it early, you can cut it out or radiate it now and cure the person and prevent them from ever developing metastatic prostate cancer in the first place. So these are the four things that screening typically identifies and what you want is to find more four and less one, two, and three. One, two, and three is not what you want. So this study comes along and it has a really interesting design and punchline. So here's the design. Um, you can kind of see it over my shoulder, but basically they randomized people um, to the experimental arm of the standard arm and the standard arm, they undergo a 10 to 12 core standard prostate biopsy and the experimental arm based on the MRI findings, they randomize you to no biopsy at all. Um, a uh, biopsy if uh, 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 that's targeted of a prostatic lesion that's problematic and a systemic biopsy, a, a 10 to 12 core biopsy in addition to that. Okay, so it's an MRI guided biopsy plus something extra, the standard biopsy, or no biopsy at all in the intervention arm based on MRI findings, or the control arm of the standard biopsy. And what they find, and their big takeaway is shown in, uh, I believe, figure one, figure two, figure two. Figure one, of course, is the consort figure. Figure two, and figure two shows that basically you can, with fewer biopsies, um, maybe about uh, half as many biopsies, um, you can have less benign so that's less of the number one. And you can have less sixes, but the same amount of sevens and beyonds, the same amount of what they call clinically significant prostate cancer. So that sounds pretty good. It sounds like you're getting less, is, less of the thing you don't want to find, the same amount of the thing you do want to find. So that sounds like this is a superior strategy, can only improve upon the standard way in which we perform biopsies. Well, that's the problem here. Now, remember, I talked about what you want to find. You want to find cancer that would otherwise metastasize and kill you before it has, and you can cure it. You don't necessarily want to find cancer that's already metastasized and will kill you no matter what you do now, or cancer that uh, in your natural life will never cause you problems, um, and you don't, certainly don't want to find benign lesions. Those are things you don't want to find. What does this sort of philosophical conception of cancer have to do with Gleason scores? And the answer is it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation. 
you know, Gleason 8s aren't always the ones that have met, always have metastasized already. And Gleason 7s aren't always the ones that if you cut it out now, you're cured. And if you didn't cut it out now, you would have died. Um, the answer is the Gleason and these clinical scenarios uh, only have some partial overlap and surrogacy, and it's actually kind of ill-defined. So in other words, this paper, which sounds really good, sounds like you find less of what you don't want to find and more of what you do want to find. In reality, it's not able to tell you at all if what you're finding is what you want to find or what you don't. So for instance, it's possible that by using the MRI strategy, all of the early benign disease and all of the sixes and all of the sevens you're finding, those were either going to be stuff that wasn't going to do anything in your natural life or stuff that's already metastasized and is going to kill you. Um, the eights might be preferentially stuff that's already metastasized and is going to kill you. And you're actually finding a lot less number four, the thing that hasn't yet spread, that if you find an interdict on it, you can improve outcomes or cure someone of the disease. You might be finding less of that thing because that thing, that entity is not paired one-to-one -one with Gleason's of any amount. Now, there's some other complexities of this paper that make it more difficult, but let me try to restate this point one more time. What is the key here? In the philosophical thinking of cancer screening, you want to find cancers that were going to do something bad, but if you find it now and you treat it now, you can prevent it from doing that bad thing, okay? On the road to finding these types of cancers, there's other things that get in the way, which is cancers that are going to do something bad, even if you find them now, they're already spread, they're already going to do something bad, or the cancers that are never going to do something bad in your natural life. What does that have to do with Gleason? The answer is nobody knows for sure. You may think, and there's some slight uh, overlap with the higher the Gleason, the more likely it is to be aggressive and already metastasized, but there's no magic Gleason number that tells you for sure this is a cancer that is going to kill you otherwise, or is going to do nothing, or has... Uh, is, is going to kill you even no matter what we do, which is actually something you don't want to find. So what are the other pitfalls of this study? The other pitfalls is one is quite interesting, which is that the authors admit to this in their results section, which is that if you ignore the standard supplement biopsy, which was a part of their MRI biopsy protocol, it's actually no longer non-inferior. You find less Gleason 7s and 8s if you ignore that supplemental 12-core biopsy, which actually suggests that if the MRI was so good, so transformative, um, then you wouldn't be needing a supplemental biopsy to maintain non-inferiority for clinically significant cancers. Um, and then the other problem has to do with the inclusion criteria, which, because this video has dragged on so long, I won't go through, but it has to do with the fact that it's including based not only on a PSA level, but a certain Stockholm 3 score, and it's excluding those people from this analysis later on, which makes one wonder about slicing and dicing the data, salami slicing, things like that, which lead to perhaps spuriously inflated or spurious results. Um, but let me, let me try to focus again on the key issue here. This paper comes along at a time where people acknowledge that prostate cancer screening, well, it definitely hurts men. It results in impotence and um, even fecal incontinence and, and rectal damage from radiation and a number of problems, including sexual dysfunction, a number of problems come from prostate cancer screening. Do men who get prostate cancer screened live longer than those who do not? The answer is no, there's been no study. And in the pool study of all the studies, there's no overall mortality benefit at all. Well, do they, are they at least less likely to die of prostate cancer? And the answer is in the European study, yeah, but in the American PLCO study and in the, in the other UK study, not really. Um, and we can debate all these studies. The European study, two of seven countries, yes, with a huge effect size in some countries, but like no effect in the other, bit bizarre. Uh, but in the American study, yes, a little contamination of the control arm, but not a ton of contamination. And we could talk about that. But this contamination, I think, is, is easy for people to say, any contamination, it's no good. Um, funny, they don't actually hold that philosophy true for other parts of oncology, but be that as it may, I think the amount of contamination is a minor problem in the PLCL study. Um, so this study comes along and says, we can improve upon prostate cancer screening because MRIs mean you find all the same bad stuff you want to find with less of that over-treatment, over-diagnosis cancer. But the problem is that the Gleason and what you actually want to find do not go hand in hand. Um, and in fact, no one knows for sure the Gleason 7s they're not finding and the Gleason 7s they're finding, those might be fundamentally different Gleason 7s because Gleason 7 and Gleason 8 and all the data around it were developed based on the standard core biopsy, the standard way in which we biopsy. When you can see the lesion and go in and biopsy, that Gleason 7 that comes out of that lesion that you have targeted and biopsied, that might have different predictive value than the Gleason 7 that was a blind biopsy. You see what I mean? You know where you're going 
if anything, if something is three plus four or four plus three, it's much more likely to be four plus three if you use the MRI, if the MRI is in fact pointing to four more than three. You see what I mean? Uh, by that, I mean the, the standard way in which the numerical scoring system is assigned is the largest percentage of the core uh, that is of a certain grade uh, is the first number and the smaller percentage is the second number. But when you use a different visualization technique to biopsy the core, um, you may be more likely to find the bad thing and not the good thing. So you may be artificially up staging some people who otherwise would have a lower Gleason number. Um, and, and that builds into the problem that a Gleason 7 is not a Gleason 7. A Gleason 7 obtained by a different mechanism might be fundamentally different than the Gleason 7 that's obtained the old-fashioned way. So one cannot rely strictly on those correlations. But the broader problem here is that we do not know of all these four buckets, I guess we know for the one, we know for the benign lesions, you find less benign lesions, that's good. But the key buckets are these other cancer buckets, the cancer that's not gonna do anything, that's gonna kill you anyway, and the cancer you can interdict upon and make a difference. And we have no idea at all which we're finding more of or which we're finding less of. So how might you do this study the correct way? The correct way isn't easy, my friends. As cancer screening, the correct way for all this stuff isn't gonna be easy. For your blood-based cancer screening tests, for CT lung cancer screening, what's actually right, what's actually best for patients, it isn't easy, and that's why nobody wants to do it. But the right way to do this study is a three-arm randomized control trial in America, and I think now you can really pull it off in a way you've never pulled it off before. Here are the three arms, no screening at all, no screening, there's still total justification for no screening at all. We don't know if people who are screened live longer, live better. We've never known it. We still don't know it. So no screening could be a control arm. And I think now in primary care offices, people would actually follow through with no screening. Enthusiasm for PSA has been decimated over the last 15 years. I think they really stick to it. No screening. Second arm, screening, yearly PSA screening, the standard, bio, the standard arm of this study. That's, there are a lot of people out there who still think that's best let them have a crack at it. So that's the second arm of the study. And the third arm of the study, MRI targeted screening. You can use this protocol. That's fine with me. Um, and those are the three arms of the study. The primary endpoint of the study is all-cause mortality. I think it's time to do it. It's time to pony up all-cause mortality. You want to get, I, I actually haven't done the power calculation. I should have done it before I recorded, but I'm guessing we're talking about 1.5 mil to 2.5 mil-ish um, kind of participants. Um, you know, you may say, wow, that's a mega randomized control trial. We could never do that. Well, you know what? Uh, I guess that's the kind of losing attitude. Uh, that's why we didn't do the recovery study. So if you have that loser attitude, well, then fine, you could be a loser. But if you want to be a winner, you'd actually find the way to do this study because this is the future. People will be doing these studies within 100 years and you'll look like, uh, I think, quite foolish. Um, and the study should be powerful, what you care about, all cause mortality and then cumulative morbidity. So some cumulative health quality scale we could apply to everybody. And we can look at the other things too all cancer mortality, metastasis free survival, even prostate cancer mortality. We can look at all those things you want, um, but I think I would power it for OM. And you know, we know prostate cancer counts for two to 3% of all uh, cause of death. Um, so, you know, it is a, uh, not a trivial, not a 0%, uh, not a 0.2%, but you know, two to 3% of the reason why men die. And so I think it, it would be an important study. Um, and what you might find is that MRI finds just as many sevens and eights, but actually has way more prostate cancer mortality than the standard method. And you might find doing nothing actually has the same overall mortality with preserved or even better quality of life. You never know what this study might give. Um, but what I would promise you is from this study alone, you cannot conclude that MRI is non-inferior to standard biopsy when it comes to prostate cancer death. Um, you can conclude it's less likely to find benign lesions, but of the cancers you're finding, you really don't know what you're getting. And I think that's the major flaw of this study. This study is going to be misinterpreted because people have trouble thinking about cancer screening. It's one of the hardest topics there is, but I think it's important to get it right. And it's important that whether this is GRAIL, whether this is national lung cancer screening, whether this is prostate cancer screening, the rules of cancer screening should be the same. You're taking healthy people, you claim you have something that benefits them. So does that make you uh, right? No, you have to have evidence to be right. And if you're not right, you're no better than the people who sell them whatever crazy thing they're selling at vitamin stores or whatever nonsense I read on the internet. You're no better than those people unless you know for sure you improve their overall mortality or their overall quality of life. You got no clue here. You've never had a clue. And this study is obfuscation from getting the clue. Um, you're using Gleason, the audience is being deceived into thinking you're finding all the quote clinically significant, but you're using those words, I don't think you know what they mean. That's not really clinically significant. Clinically significant is if the thing you're finding 
is the thing we can do prostatectomy on, and then the patient doesn't die of prostate cancer later. And not you're finding things, we do the prostatectomy, they die anyway, or you're finding things, we do the prostatectomy, and they never would have died otherwise. And you don't know what you're, you're getting. And this is the same problem with the Google AI mammography study. So that's my review of this paper. And I bit, I, I'm sorry that's longer than what I hope to do on these short little videos, um, but uh, I hope it was helpful. So until next time, until...